streaming live. Going. So I would, um, I suggest we proceed and I'll go over to the stream channel to make sure that it's coming in. But okay. we are now recording and we're now streaming and I'm going away. All right, now we'll stick around there in the darkness. Um, <laughs> this is, <laughs> welcome everybody. This is a Friday afternoon General <laughs> Housing and Military Affairs Committee meeting. Um, we Today we are going to be hearing from uh, members of the Scott administration. They're going to take us through the proposal that was um, made last week and the text was issued earlier this week of their proposal. We also have uh, David Hall is here who will follow up their conversation with um, with what he's been working on. He's been tasked with being uh, the legislative council who's translating these words into bill form. And we're just at the beginning of a process which is gonna move pretty quickly. Um, this is an economic recovery bill that's affecting, um, that's proposed to affect small businesses. Uh, in our case, uh, the, what was proposed was, was rental assistance and kind of a supercharged VHIP program that we're well aware of, of, of a housing incentive program that would bring other apartments online. Um, and so we wanted to give the administration an opportunity to give us an overview of what the whole package is like, and then to be specific about the, the housing portion. And I believe we, I'm not sure exactly how we had this lined up, but I think we were gonna start with Commissioner Goldstein, is that right? And then, um, and then um, I guess I'll, while, while the commissioner is speaking, I'll go look at my agenda and, and, <laughs> see, what, and see how we listed up the folks. But um, uh, just in terms of housekeeping in our committee, if you do have a question, and that includes any of the administration folks who want to chime in, um, go down into the, under the participants section and, and there's the raise hand feature. We use that in this committee. Um, in order to create a line of folks who may have questions. Um, I will mute everybody uh, except for the speaker. And with that, I'm gonna do that right now. Uh, and with that, um, come back and unmute. And, and I think I've unmuted Joan, but in terms of anybody else, if I call your name, you can unmute yourself, I think is probably the easiest way to go about this. So welcome everybody and the microphone is yours, Commissioner. Thank you for joining us and for and for starting off this conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and the rest of the committee to give us time to go through the proposal. Um, I'll just do the broad overview. Most of my work on this has been concerning the financial and technical assistance piece of the package and Josh uh, could take you through the more detail on the housing and Commissioner Pelham is here to talk about the marketing proposal. Um, basically, as you may already be aware, the agency pretty much changed our whole operation from the beginning of COVID to be one of COVID response. We've got a response unit with phone and email so that we could be in touch with businesses. We were in a very uh, unenviable position of closing businesses down and also working through all of the restart and all the extenuating circumstances for restart and what has to happen. Uh, as a result, we um, have been really like a communications hub. And so part of that being that hub, we were able to collect information about the damage that's being done by the closures. Um, it was a health it is a health crisis, but turned very quickly into an economic crisis. And um, we tried as best as we can to get impact surveys. And the impact survey that we were able to collect was like 3,500 businesses, uh, which isn't a bad sample, um, reporting upwards of $350 million a month in lost revenue. So it was very quick to understand just how enormous this crisis was. As soon as we understood about the state allocation of COVID relief funds, we started to piece together a proposal that could impact all sectors um, and try to uh, repair the economy and repair the structure of the economy. Um, as soon as businesses were all closed, it became very quick to see how the revenues are gonna dry up for the state. 
So how do we get people back to restarting their businesses, hiring people back, and being able to sustain a level of operation, uh, even though it's out of severely, in some cases, severely uh, limited capacity. And the one thing that the COVID Relief Fund Treasury guidance did say was that grant money could be given to small business for the business interruption costs. So we designed of the, of the 400 million, I should say, the 310 is the immediate assistance, which we think we need in order to survive before we could even think about uh, and, and go into this thrive uh, mentality and, and repair. 310, of the 310, 250 uh, has been allocated for financial assistance, the lion's share of it. Um, and again, that is because so many of the sectors are still closed or, or partially closed and really, really damaged. How do we help those businesses um, get to a point where they could even think about reopening? And the idea here was get money out as quickly as we could, as feasibly as we could. There's no way that we could handle thousands of applications. We did. We wanted as much as possible to avoid a bottleneck. So having said all of that, just to give background and context about how we came up with this, um, we thought that in order to distribute funds where they're most needed, we needed a strategy and tactics on how to deploy um, people to, to be at the ready. So we immediately thought of tax department. They're able to process uh, lots of data, lots of checks, lots of distribution in a very effective fashion and in a fashion where it's auditable. And we thought, well, at the very least, we could take care of the retail sector, the uh, food and accommodation services sectors because of this uh, funds flow through tax. And we've designed a, a formula where uh, as part of the filing process, tax will make those funds available. And we could impact over about 11,000 businesses thereabouts from the modeling that tax department did. So that's the first, you know, sort of, that's one avenue. That's one way to get funding to folks. The other is the Agency of Agriculture. They have a, a whole separate proposal. Part of this proposal though, is $50 million for dairy producers and value added dairy producers. They would administer that. Uh, the other is we thought we'd engage VITA. And VITA has already, they do an enormous amount of loans. We thought, why don't we organize a similar structure where we could have advances, sort of grant money and loan money through VITA. We know that a maximum grant amount that we've set is not gonna be enough to uh, take care of the revenue that's been lost. We can't replace all the lost revenue. So what we can do is make loan money available to those who need more than just the grant. And so Vita worked with us to design a system where businesses can get like 0% financing for the first year, no repayment. And it was predominantly meant for the sectors that were not covered by that tax or agriculture um, disbursements. Um, and we know there are many others, personal care, personal services, so Vita will do that portion. And then the uh, other distribution channel is really the regional revolving loan funds. There are many around the state, they're underutilized. How do we engage them to disperse funds for the very smallest of businesses? So five and less, let's say. And uh, this, these funds will help them with, again, grant and loan opportunities. So that's the, the financial part of the package. The, the other, part of the package that I worked on was the financial, the technical assistance. And so people need help financially, but they also need some technical expertise. They need some professional services. You know, they've been closed for months. They're starting to reopen. Who do they pay first? How do they get the suppliers back? Um, how do they reconfigure their space to be more effective in this new environment? Um, how do they get a better online presence if they're a retail operator? So it's a, a portion of money where we could say, okay, we need technical assistance where we could direct people to the right grant or loan, but we also need accounting help or legal help or software consultancy or uh, turnaround specialists, debt restructurers. You know, there's any number of issues that businesses are going to face as they as they open and as they operate in limited capacity. So that's the, that we asked for 5 million on that. 
um, Josh will take you through the housing and Heather will take you through, through marketing, but you'll see the package is meant to kind of impact all of the sectors that, that were um, harmed and how to, how best should the government intervene to help stem that, that tide and how to um, repair and, and really not have this temporary crisis become permanent damage. Gee, so gee. that's all I was going to present, but unless you wanted to go precisely through the language of the bill or if there's any questions, I'm happy to take that now. Um, yeah, there's the representative Kalecki. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I have two questions for you. Um, when you say the uh, retail, food, and and accommodations, are you including the cultural organizations as well, like the Brattleboro Museum or Paramount Theater in Rutland or Shelburne Museum? Are they included in that group of um, industries, I guess? Yeah. So um, one thing that we're noticing as we message this is that um, we need the message to be clear that the help is available to all. Yeah. And even though they may not, those, those entities that you just mentioned would not be eligible under the tax disbursement scheme because they're not paying necessarily the rooms and meals taxes. Um, they would be eligible under the VITA portion. VITA could make the grant and loans available to nonprofit sector. Okay. So Thank they will for, be covered. Great. Thank you for that. The, and my second question is, some of those groups, I used to run the Flynn Center, so um, some of the groups have gotten the, um, the PPP loans and they are worried now that they will not be eligible to get state funding through these loans because they have this. Uh, right. Federal. Is that true? No, it's, uh, so it's partly. So what it is, is um, first we want preference to be given to people who didn't get anything. That was like, the most important thing was there are people who did not get anything. Yes. And then the second is how do we work out the mechanism whereby we're not paying, there's, there's, a, there's a stipulation in the guidance where you're not allowed to use the funds for things that have already been reimbursed by federal programs and particularly by programs that are covered within CARES Act. So um, we have to figure out the best way to do that. The way it's written right now, um, it looks like we are subtracting out the amounts that they received. And I know a lot of, there's a lot of pushback on that because in some cases it'll wipe out exactly what their grant will be, but there, there may be another mechanism. We're working with tax on the tax piece and others to figure out how to really assess what the unmet need still is and then um, subtract out whatever portion was received by the other program. So there, I think there's a workaround. We just haven't, it's not in the, it's not in the legislation as it looks right now. We, we were piecing everything together and then we thought we, we need to get this over to you guys. And um, so we are still adjusting, but we could adjust that. But it's not that they're not eligible. It would just be, how do we properly subtract the amount that they've received so that we're not, um, we're avoiding duplication of, of funding. Okay, that, that's great. Because as you know, the Paramount and the Flins are going to be the last ones to open because they're such large venues or so they're, they're yes. going to, they close first and they're going to open last probably. So they're going to have a much more extended period of nothingness. Yes. Um, so anyway, I appreciate your openness to, to hearing it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It represented Triano and then Hengo. Uh, thank you for being here, Commissioner. I just uh, quickly, um, I recall back when we first got a report on uh, or a breakdown of the early COVID relief fund uh, uh, funds that came into the state, and some of them were directed toward arts and nonprofits. And I guess my question is, how are those two um, meeting up with uh, with what you're telling us today? Yeah, I mean, basically, the way the guidance looks like, like anything that we distribute. There has to be some sort of um, reduction for what has already been sent out to folks. So there can't be this duplication of federal funds because whatever we're giving is really coming from the federal. It's coming from the same act, basically. It's the CARES That's Act. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> right, right. So I think that would fall under the same category. I think what we're contemplating is an application where someone's going to state, 
you know, here's their lost revenue, here's what they've received so far, and then, okay, there's unmet need, and we apply our formula. If it's less than the unmet need, great, they, they get it. If it's more, then they won't get, they, they won't get anything, so. Okay, great, thank you. Great. All right, Representative Hengo. Thank you. Do you happen to have any um, visual testimony that you could submit to us that kind of shows the breakdown? Sure, uh, and I should have shared that if I knew how to do it on Zoom. I know how to do it on Teams, but uh, we've got on uh, accd.vermont.gov website, there is a, um, a great infographic that uh, Commissioner Pelham put together. It has the breakdown of the four segments. It also has one pagers that describe this. Um, so it's much better to look at visually than just a bunch of text. Um, but we, we could send that to you. Or Jess, do you have that maybe to forward yeah, or I share or something? Is sure. it the same one? Is it the same one from um, the 22nd? Is that the most updated one? The one that came out last week? Because I think we did see the yes. slide deck last week and uh, Representative Zot just posted it again, the link to it in our chat box. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if that's not been updated, then that's then that's there it is right there. Yeah, it's there. It's good. And then, you know, that was phase one. And then phase two, the, there's remaining money. We we are expecting an ability to either use that for additional financial assistance, broadband, um, perhaps seed capital, um, you know, for businesses that are starting or scaling up. Um, so those are things that are in discussion right now. We haven't finalized that, but we know that phase one is enough to digest for right now, so. Right, and to be clear, um, there are proposals in the works for other sectors. This is, this what we're talking about today is economic recovery for these, for these particular sectors, but that there is other, there are others in the works, um, I think in probably all the branches, um, so. Um, yeah, like so, AHS is going to be presenting something, you know, hospitals and healthcare. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, okay, next up, I have Representative Walls. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I I just want to be clear uh, about how these funds could be used by a business uh, to pay rent, to rehire folks. Are there any restrictions in how they can use the funds. Yeah, so the way I read of the relief fund is that it can't just be for general expansion or general business purposes. It really is about um, helping the business with the costs incurred. So, you know, from the business interruption. So at first we thought of this as any fixed cost that they have, like irrespective of being open or not, they're gonna have fixed costs they should be allowed to use it. The, the exceptions to that are they're not supposed to use it for taxes, they're not supposed to use it for, I'm, I'm getting confused about whether utility payments are allowed, but we, we lay that out in the, in the legislation about eligible uses versus ineligible. And um, I think the guidance is very specific about, you know, you can't just use it for a business expansion unless it's something, maybe maybe a restaurant wants to expand its outdoor seating. Well, that makes sense, right? Um, things that they have to amend because of this COVID or post-COVID world, um, not just general business purposes. Okay. And we think there's plenty of need out there, so. I'd like to clarify that a little bit more. So uh, a definition of expansion is rehiring staff considered expansion. No, no, that would be an eligible use. That would totally be an eligible use. Payroll, rent, um, insurance costs, you know, anything that they have to pay to, to, stay, <clears throat> to stay in business. Um, but not things that would be sort of outside of the, out, outside of their duress, you know, caused by the COVID um, crisis. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Representative Byron Ben Zott. Thank you. How are you doing, Commissioner? Good. How are you? Not bad. Thank you. So, uh, surprisingly, I got a PPP question for you. Um, so, there's a there's a lot of operators out there, as you know, who are really concerned about um, if they fall out of compliance and the usability that turning into the um, a short term loan. 
at a you know high payment level. Uh, I am aware and following the PPP Flexibility Act that's you know making its way through Congress right now, so I'm optimistic on some of that stuff. But has anyone given thought should um, Vermonters find themselves in a position where they've got a large PPP loan if they could buy that out on the Vita loan? so they could carry it over to a longer term of repayment? Yeah, we did think about that. We actually talked about that. Um, again, part of the impetus for this was knowing that PPP was not going to be good for all, for all borrowers. Um, I do know some people are getting deep with that right now, and I don't know if it's gonna be a good thing if those terms don't federally change. Well, yeah, I mean that, so part of our issue here, on top of vagueness on guidance, on guidance, mm -hmm. on top of urgency of the need, we also have this thing where PPP, you know, I think you have until November to apply for forgiveness. So we're not going to know the status of that for a very long time, right? I mean, months seem to be an eternity in COVID time, right? So, so to answer your question, you know, we didn't want to wait for finalized guidance to come out. We just knew there was a gap created by the federal um, programs. And yeah, I, I think the situation is that the PPP loans could turn into an 18 month repayment period. You know, people would have a huge loan. So I think a lot of borrowers are holding back from using it because they're fearful of that. So it's not been useful for them. And the irony is we're gonna to have to subtract it out of our, whatever we give out to you all. But I don't know a way around it other than being non-compliant, which is not an option. Um, yeah. You know, the only thing we could say is that it still makes sense for people to apply for PPP because it's a guaranteed, it's a federally guaranteed loan. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we talked to Vita about can they refinance it, for people who were left out, the thought was, well, why would folks want to refinance it when it's an already federally guaranteed loan? So if you can't pay it, the feds come in and pay it. So there is some validity to that argument. However, no one wants to go yeah. uh, alone to go bad. So No, certainly. I mean, that's the uniqueness of the PPP. They put those out so quick. Nobody has collateral or personal guarantees on it. It's really kind of, I'll just say unique. Um, so yeah. right. no, I, I see your point. I'm glad the conversation had come up already. Oh yeah. Representative Zott. Hi. Um, I tend to like to have, uh, some obtuse big picture questions. Um, so forgive me for this. So I, you know, the, the, the title of the slide deck is Vermont economic recovery package. And so when I look at that, it sort of conveys to me a certain conception of what the economy is. Um, and so what I mean more specifically is I'm looking at it and it looks as if there's about 1% of the $400 million that might actually, and that's, and this is only potentially end up in the pockets of consumers. So it seems like the Vermont economy is conceptualized, but this aid package is not comprised of consumers in any way. Um, and as I understand it, the, the, the program I'm referring to is the 3.75 million for the regional marketing and consumer stimulus grants, but there's no guarantee even that that money will actually end up in a direct consumer stimulus program. It might just be marketing and sort of downtown signs or something or a, uh, you know, an ad in a paper, but it won't necessarily translate to money in the pockets of consumers. And so I was heartened to hear from the chair that there are more proposals forthcoming. Do you know if there are any proposals that include people from the spending side of the equation? Um, I don't know, maybe Heather, is that more for you? Or I, I, I do not know of any, but that does not mean that they're not being formulated as we speak. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for you. We, we recognize that demand, consumer demand and pent up demand will be an issue as people reopen. We want to encourage them to spend in Vermont. So I think that the package that's been determined by uh, marketing will, will do that. I think we have to balance that with making sure there are businesses still around for them to spend the money in. 
So our first focus was really about reopening business and making sure we can get business to reopen. If they're open, then they could hire people and then people will have funding to, you know, it's sort of like this whole interconnected ecosystem of the economy, you know, it, kind of it all has to happen at once. Uh, the federal, you know, government sent out stimulus. I don't know if there's gonna be a second one, but yeah, we, we do not have that in our package, a, a stimulus. You know, we just, we wanna get businesses open and we wanna make sure they're sustainable. Well, I, I believe it was uh, Josh Hanford who threw out an idea. I don't think he was saying that it was a concrete idea. I think he was just throwing it out as an example uh, that there might be local consumer um, spending cards that might have like a one-to-one -one match. So you, you put $50 on this debit card, but you get $100 of purchasing power. And that's something that, you know, I would be super excited about and support as long as it was paired with people who who are especially vulnerable and maybe get cards of a say a fifty dollar value that put nothing towards it because we can't we can't just rely on people who already have purchasing power and doubling it. We have to also think about the people who have no purchasing power. Yeah, I think uh, I think Commissioner Pelham will take you through what the marketing um, piece is with the consumer stimulus piece. So. If it pleases the chair, I'd be happy to address that subject. Um, well, let me take one more question from Representative Howard for Rep for Commissioner Goldstein, and then and then we'll pass the microphone to you, and you can you can pick it up from there. Thank you, um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, my question is along the lines of uh, Representative Walls. I have a couple of constituents; they are the sole proprietor of their business, and um, they have received no assistance whatsoever. And um, so what expenses would of theirs would be considered um, in this plan? So um, they, well, I'm, I'm assuming they have expenses, right? Uh, so do they pay rent? Do they? One, uh, uh, one constituent, uh, her business is in her house. So I suppose the, um, all right, so the way that we've designed this is definitely to help people with their fixed expenses. If they don't have fixed expenses, it really sounds like it would be um, a, their lost revenue, but I can't make that assumption until we knew precisely what that person's scenario is. Um, mm -hmm. But suffice it to say, they will have the opportunity to apply for either the VITA grant or the revolving loan fund, if they're sole proprietor with only themselves, or if they have, even if they have some employees, um, they will be able to apply. They, there is assistance for kind of every stripe of business in this package. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so thank you, Commissioner. Um, Thanks. And I'm just gonna go right uh, right over to um, Heather and nope, oh, I just muted you. There you go. Um, welcome to General Housing Military Affairs. And um, I don't know if you want to start off by talking about the the question on the table, or if you want to just start with with your review and then and then move on. And then I'm sure we'll have some follow up questions as well. Sure. Thank you. So for the record. My name is Heather Pelham. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Tourism and Marketing. Um, I think I will just give you a little bit of a brief overview because it does include that consumer stimulus program and then we can dive into more of the details. Um, so getting right into it, as Commissioner Goldstein explained the program, you know, we see this as a, as a bit of a continuum of aid. So when we're thinking about how do we help these businesses recover from this pandemic and this crisis, Step one is giving them the financial assistance and the technical assistance to open up. And then we see step two is making sure that that economic activity to get people back through their doors is stimulated. So the two parts of the marketing part of this package will be one, there's the consumer stimulus piece, and then there's a promotional campaign piece. Um, so the promotional campaign piece is, is the smaller part. It's, it's, it's um, proposed at 1.25 million right now. That would be to encourage in-state spending 
Um, we know that we're generally reliant on out-of-state visitors, and right now that's not possible for us to uh, get the same kind of revenue stream from that population as we might otherwise. So we're looking at how can we encourage Vermonters to spend locally to support those local businesses to help them get back on their feet, especially knowing that they will not be able to invest in marketing the way they might otherwise have at this difficult time when they reopen. The other part of it is knowing that, you know, Vermonters only have so much purchasing capacity. How can we make that go so much further? So the, the bulk of the marketing proposal is about a consumer stimulus piece. Um, and it is, it is just that. It's like, how can we stimulate economic activity uh, to help make these businesses more sustainable? So it's, it, it's, not, it's not just about getting them open again, but how can we make sure that they stay open? So this, the consumer stimulus idea is that we would divide amongst the major regions of the state large grants that they could develop a consumer stimulus program that might make the best sense for them. I've used an example of a gift card program as one such possibility, there, there are others, but the way it would work is, as we were just sort of talking about, there would be um, any number of businesses in a community that had lost revenues from this pandemic. And as far as we understand the guidance, we really do need to tie all of this funding back to business interruption from the pandemic. So businesses would be able to sign up to be part of this program, um, and then consumers would be able to, and in the example of the gift card, buy a $25 gift card, it would actually be worth $50 and that money would go directly back to the business. So it would, it would put money into the hands of the consumers in the sense that they would then be able to purchase those services more affordably than they might otherwise, but the business, excuse me, but the revenue does go directly to the business, which as we understand um, is a requirement for this CARES Act funding. Um, so the way we envision the program working is that we are in the process of about to put out an RFP to see um, how we can make this as easy as possible for regions to be able to choose. It doesn't have to be a gift card program. There are other buy local type models that someone could use um, so that we could flesh out how a program will, like that would work so that the, um, the regions would be able to implement that as quickly as possible. And the idea there also, just like with the financial assistance, is that we would hope to touch as many you know, businesses as possible. So this would be you know, not just for restaurants or lodging facilities, but it would be for cultural institutions, for, you know, came up this morning, even a plumber, anybody who, any business who has suffered loss due to this pandemic um, and has a monetary transaction for those, those services, we see them as being potential um, potentially able to participate in this program. So that's the broad overview. I'm not sure if I completely answer the question um, and I'd be happy to elaborate um, if we want to rephrase it, but so it's, it, it is purchasing power for consumers, but the money does funnel through to the business directed, directly impacted by COVID due to the guidelines as we understand it. Okay, Representative Gonzalez. So I, I hear that one of the constraints that you are trying to work within is that the CARES Act, uh, the way that the rules seem to be is that the money has to go to the businesses. And so that's, that's the, the needle that you're trying to thread. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And, and Jess, Vincent, are you still with the Department of Labor? I am. And so when it comes to um, some of the employee issues, I just wanted to touch on this because it all is really, it is all interconnected. Um, but the idea that uh, if you could remind us how long for the people who are unemployed uh, and can't get back to work yet, uh, the federal program of extra, the extra $600 extends to when? That extends to July 31st. And the protections that we put in on a state level, um, are they still in place? The protections of, if I feel like, um, if I, if I feel like I'm in danger of, of getting the virus um, through my workplace that I can still opt into the UI program, is that still in place or is people reopen and they offer, they say, hey, we're, we're reopening our restaurant. Um, 
do you want to come back to work? Do I still have the option to um, stay out of work if I fear like I'm going to um, come across a vector I don't want to come across? Yes, that's kind of a two part answer. So if you are going to refuse work for a COVID-19 related reason, then you would be able to choose to separate from your employer and likely still qualify for unemployment benefits. Unfortunately, even under the law passed, being concerned about contracting the virus without kind of a bona fide health reason or um, without, you know, or without, I don't want to say proof, but without a proof really that your employer maybe isn't following OSHA or CDC guidance, that would not qualify you. So we say that if you feel like you are at risk because your employer maybe isn't, you know, providing PPE or they're not, you know, enforcing social distancing or something like that, then we would consider that um, as a, you know, a good cause quit if those factors were proven. And just a reminder, because it's been three months, um, sure. <laughs> where in a case like that, I mean, my memory of, of the um, UI experience rating is that if you are offering your the jobs back in time or the amount of jobs back in time that you won't be affected by the experience rating a year from now, is that still in place for the yeah, employers? So yeah, so the way that the bill passed, it actually extended UI experience rating relief for eight weeks. Um, the commissioner, and then gave the commissioner discretion to extend beyond that. The commissioner has extended that experience rating relief through the governor's extension of the ex um, of the emergency order. So I get uh, through June fifteenth. It's likely that it will extend with the emergency order as well. Um, we are doing some modeling. Um, at the department to see what the impacts to the trust fund would be if it were to continue through the end of the year. But for right now, um, the discretion is with the commissioner. Okay. And can I trust that the employers are up to date on these, these changes as they, as yes. they uh, <laughs> develop? It's really yes, you know, we've been the hardest trying, part. Yeah, we've been trying to mass communicate, but we also get questions, single questions every day from employers that we're trying to answer on a timely basis. So, okay. And before I get back to Josh, um, just and while I still have everyone else here, uh, just the, the I've asked this question of the folks in AHS and OEO, and and I'll ask you in your division because you're it's a special treat to have you here. Is um, is uh, do you have anyone who is um, working on Plan E or F or G? Like what? I mean, this is, we as government officials, as, as, as politicians, as legislators, we're, and as humans, we're anxious to like have a linear direction for the end of a crisis. And the problem with this crisis is that we don't know what the end is and we don't know what twists and turns it may take in terms of another um, stay at home order might come up because there's a because there's a snapback have do we have planning that's starting in place that's you know someone sitting in the a cubicle in the back just doing you know really scenario planning about what may happen because all of this work that we're doing is moving us forward and that's and that's to be expected and that's that's we appreciate it and we expect it and that's what we're doing but there's that thing in the back of everybody's mind um and I'm just curious to know um, if we've started that planning yet or if we're aware of that we need to um, have that voice in the back of our head remind us that things may change um, with, with the advent of more negative news. Yeah, I, I can't say that we have a full on plan all figured out, um, but I think one thing the crisis has shown is our ability to kind of adapt and adjust Having said that, we do know that we need to plan for what if there's another um, another surge. And so some examples, which may sound more tactical, but nonetheless, it's an example of kind of forward thinking and um, emergency management is 
and I guess you should talk to them as well, but we've been in contact with them about planning a, a PPE production in the state as an example, and what does that entail and how do we attract that to happen and how do we work with our existing businesses who have pivoted and tried to create that? How do we partner with entities that are already supplying hospitals? So that's one conversation taking place. Um, you know, another is if this does happen, I know that public service department has a plan in place about making sure there's broadband, making sure that there's um, every student can learn remotely, every worker could work remotely, as well as, you know, if that's feasible, but we don't want broadband or lack of broadband to be the reason. Um, so th those are some of the things that we're working on and we're thinking about. Um, you know, we're also, this idea of phase two is to set aside a portion of funding so that we could we could see what happens after this initial phase you know let's go and reassess and pivot if necessary you know do we need more funding do we need more business assistance do we need more landlord assistance like we don't know really the outcome on this um you know but we're all you know we're all thinking about it this is like the type of situation where no one knows the right answers but we're we learned from this experience and we're gonna to continue to adjust and try to foresee how, how could we best be equipped, you know? Yeah, no, I, it's, no, there's no, I know there's no good answer to the, my question and except to know that people are thinking yeah. that, that, it's, that it's a possibility. Um, I have a couple of more questions here, um, Representative Hango and then Walls. Thank you, I think this question is probably maybe it's not even a question, but an observation um, directed more at commerce and um, labor, just about employment. There are a number of small businesses in, in my district and actually um, Northern Vermont in general, and I'm sure in a lot of rural Vermont, there are small businesses where um, they're having trouble attracting and keeping workers because they've been, the workers have been incentivized with mm. extra benefits. Um, so I just want to keep that in mind. And are any parts of this proposed legislation addressing that particular issue? So the difficulty on the unemployment situation, the, the, the extra funding that, that came through, that was really done through federal right. means. So um, we can't do anything about that particular occurrence. Um, I think the only thing that's within the state power is to adjust the unemployment stipend, um, which has its own issues, um, but that is what's within the state's control. The other angle, and some businesses have asked us about this, like, you know, they, they can't get people back, but if they got a PPP loan, and they got people back and were able to increase their rate of pay, that could be forgivable. You know, that could be considered as part of the payroll expense and could be forgivable. So that might be an inducement for them to come back. And the other is really just a question of the, you know, look, it is a short term nature. If it's over July 31st, um, you know, is somebody going to risk their career on two months of additional? Funding. The answer might be yes, you know, and, and there is very little we could do with federal money to take care of what the federal additional funding created, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know if Jess, you have some other thoughts on, you know, if somebody refuses work, you know, they're really not entitled to unemployment. Um, yeah, so but, um, yeah. Uh, Representative Hango, I think what your comment is what we're hearing a lot of. And I think mm. at the Department of Labor, we're trying to balance the fact that, you know, the that extra $600 for someone who's laid off and having to pay extra groceries or extra health insurance, or, you know, I think that there, I, um, I think that there is a need in, you know, there, there is a need for that $600. Um, for 
some Vermonters, maybe not most, or probably most Vermonters. On the other hand, to your question about what we're doing, um, and again, this is a this is a fine balance. Understanding that there are individuals who might have legitimate COVID nineteen related reasons for not returning to work, um, but if your employer offers work to you and you refuse, um, we have set up a system on the Department of Labor website for employers to let us know that they've offered that individual work and that they've refused because there's not a COVID-19 qualifying reason that would disqualify them um, from benefits. So that is you know, one, one avenue or one, I guess, communications method that we're trying to like put out there as we reopen the economy. The other piece, um, is that right now the Department of Labor has suspended work search. So typically if you are unemployed, you have to complete three work searches um, for every uh, week that you are unemployed after 10 weeks. We've suspended that currently. And as soon, and again, we're weighing all options here and trying to make sure that we do it at the right time, but there, I think there will come a time when we will implement that work search again to encourage folks once the economy you know, really reopens to complete those. Um, and return and return to work. So I think those are really the two mechanisms um, that at least we've flagged right now um, to try to address that. Um, understanding that employers might not want to, you know, report employees for not or for refusing work. I mean, there's we're, we're again, it's a it's a fine balance. Thank you. I think um, the the particular individuals, businesses that I've heard from most recently are businesses that had trouble finding employees to begin with um, before COVID-19. Um, they're still struggling and their struggle now includes people who have um, been laid off from other jobs um, who have been in contact with them and they've reached out and people have said, no, thanks. It's good. I've got my extra benefits, I'm, I'm good right now. So I think it's the businesses that were um, trying to build their workforce before the crisis mm -hmm. are still having trouble um, building their workforce and um, who may be small enough that this could be a make or break whether they're going to stay in business. So those are the businesses that I'm really con most concerned about at this moment. If you could just keep that in the back of your minds. Thank you. Yeah, and if and if you wanna pass those along to me or my work for, or our workforce development team, we are working with businesses who are hiring, trying to get that message out there in their communities. So I would encourage you to, you know, if you wanna take it offline, we can talk about it and um, we can help promote those jobs. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. All right, Representative Walls and then Gonzalez. Uh, thank you. I, I hope you can address this. Uh, this was a number of weeks ago. I believe the Central Vermont Medical Center uh, bought a large quantity of masks from an individual who bought them very cheaply and then sold them at something like 200% profit. Uh, and I believe the Attorney General got involved. Uh, but I don't remember the outcome of that case. But anyway, my point is, I wonder if there are any safeguards against price gouging. For example, it makes sense to me if large consumers such as hospitals could purchase through the state and there would be some kind of secure process. So I, um, I'm not that familiar with it. I remember reading a little bit about it and I know that the AG was very adamant about that there will not or should not, or they will, they will pursue those who are in, engaging in price gouging. But what I did get a glimpse into was that um, emergency management, emergency management, and the health network uh, in Vermont worked very closely together to source and to vet the sources of uh, equipment manufacturers. So. Uh, I was only involved tangentially, but I know that those conversations took place from the very beginning of the crisis. We had done like an all points bulletin, like who produces this, can you contact us? And then we gathered together a group uh, to figure that out. And I know building and general services got involved in helping vet. So we had quite a few different agencies and um, 
to help that effort. Yeah, there were lots of questionable practices, not just price gouging, but in a sort of um, equipment that didn't fit the standards. And yeah, so there, there was a lot of uh, coordination on that regard, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm afraid, you know, if a lot more money starts flowing, it's gonna be very tempting for scammers and others to try to take advantage for it. So I hope there are programs in place. Thank you. Thanks, that's a great comment. I'm Representative Gonzalez. Jess, did I hear you correctly that you are trying to, um, or sorry, I have a screen baby in the background, um, that- uh, Ryan's napping, so he's not screaming, yeah. but he was. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, yeah, you're a good person to talk to in the moment. I'm a screen yeah. in the background. Um, that uh, you're the connection between if business if if businesses are trying to have their employees come back if businesses are open and their employees are saying I'm not in a position to do so um, and that's verifiable reasons um, yep. that you're asking businesses to connect to the Department of Labor or can you can you talk about that process? and what you all yeah, are sure. setting up in terms of verifying because I think it, it's um, yeah. very- Yeah, so, so if you, yeah, so if you, if we were to receive either from an individual or from a business that, or the Department of Labor would receive that, um, but, if, but if we were to receive um, an instance where work was refused um, or, and that individual is still filing, it would flag it in the system for us to say, you know, just Ventner, um, her that that employer reported that she refused work. She did not indicate that she refused work that week. What's the we have adjudicators that will help investigate those things. If I were to say I refused work because I for a COVID qualifying reason, so I'm at home taking care of someone who is at risk. I'm at home taking care of my school aged child or my baby because I don't have childcare. Um, or if I have been told to quarantine, then that would be a reason for that individual, or that would be a qualifying reason for that individual to keep, um, or to keep receiving benefits. So each one of those cases is adjudicated. There's fact finding in each of those cases. Um, we just, and event, we just created a mechanism for employers, I think, to more quickly let us know if they think there's, we, we've always had a mechanism for, you know, a system of fraud. So um, this is just, a separate avenue just for work refusal that we've created, but everything is um, goes into fact finding. Everything is adjudicated, um, and both parties are involved in that. If that's helpful, is there a? What my concern is okay. that with the challenges that unemployment system has had, that this is another layer that could be just yeah. challenging, and that for someone who does have a qualifying reason, but that it's. Uh, that they they still might be denied unemployment for a chunk yeah. of time. and yeah so so we, we have yeah so we've actually um, just in the last three weeks we've actually we're we're below adjudication levels even before COVID nineteen so I think on our adjudication arm we've actually resolved a lot of the backlog if not I won't say all of the backlog I don't think we're able to be we, we will ever be down to zero in that respect um, but our adjudications are taking you know less than a week. So we're talking like five to seven business days. Um, and so if that individual were to have applied during that, that time, but was deemed eligible, they will receive that back pay. But um, obviously, but we, but yeah, so that adjudication time um, and that backlog has been, again, we're below pre-COVID levels right now. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, and we haven't gotten, I don't think I, I would have to check, but as of two weeks ago, we haven't received a lot of um, work refusal um, reports from employers. So, um, but yeah, no, good point. We don't want to create, absolutely create another backlog or another list somewhere that people are trying to sort right. through. Yeah. Is there any way in your system, and I know that your system is hard to change, but to include information about the COVID qualifying reasons for denying? Um, because that, yes. that, I think like in the moment of being, of being able to say, yes, I refused work, but I refused work because of, of these qualifying reasons. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. We have added some of the healthcare ones. So if someone does refuse, I think if someone does refuse work or quits because of a healthcare COVID-19 related reason, they can indicate that. Um, but that's a good point. I'll see if we can make those changes to the weekly application. Great, thank you.
let's see, we're going to, um, I'm going to say, let's, we're going to move to Josh now. Um, I'd like to thank the three of you so far um, for weighing in on the economic development pieces of this, um, of, of your proposal. And I understand that you're all probably scheduled to go, or some of you are scheduled to be in commerce at 2.30. So if that's the case and you would like to duck out, um, please feel free. We'll keep a shackle on Josh as long as we possibly can. Um, I believe our attorney is also, um, David Hall is um, scheduled to be in commerce at 2.30 as well. So I think if we can hear from Josh now and then, um, and then committee will have a further discussion after after everybody leaves. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get David's um, walkthrough of of the housing sections, but I think again we've heard from Josh um, over the last couple of weeks, and so I think we'll get I think we'll get the bulk of that information. It's pretty clear based in the text that we've seen so far. So, um, but thank you, Joan. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jess. And um, we will have you back when we need to. Thank you. Josh, welcome back. Um, when last we spoke, we were at a place where we were waiting for the language. And so you were you presented to us as best we could, as best you could, um, what was going to be in the package. I mean, certainly what was in the immediate proposal. So if you could share with us just the, the fuller picture of uh, what is, is it section six and seven is that are those the housing sections um, of the yeah that uh, would be, yes yeah that would be great so it, again we have two sections we have the 42 million dollars in rental assistance and prevention and then eight million dollars in the um, um, again I'll keep calling it the VHIP program I'm not sure if there's a better word I mean we we know the program well enough to call it that I'm not sure that's the right phrase yet but um, but it's a supercharged VHIP program compared to what we've been contemplating for the last year or so. So if you could just fill us in on how the text came out since we saw you last, that would be great. Uh, great, well, for the record, uh, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. Um, good afternoon. Um, quite muggy afternoon here in Randolph, I must say, um, with the window shut because there's some haying going on across the street. Um, so yes, there is language in the housing section starts on page 16. I don't know if you have that. I, I, I don't know if it was on your, your website, but um, this is what was drafted uh, and discussed in um, Senate Economic Development earlier in the week. And you, you know, the, the language just puts in the text that I went over with you. Um, previously to create these two programs, Vermont Rental Housing Stabilization Fund, we're calling it, and uh, um, um, the Vermont Rehousing Recovery Fund, that's the VHIP component where we're trying to rehouse some of the homeless individuals in, in existing housing by uh, reinvesting in it. Um, you know, one of the things I want to just put out there is I've been doing a lot of research of what other states are using uh, for doing for rental assistance. And there's dozen or more states that have already stood up programs that are very similar to this. You know, it's rental arrearage, it's rental payments. Um, there's a whole bunch of variations, whether it's three months, two months, a number of them have put an actual contribution that the tenant needs to pay 30% of whatever, whatever their income is. Um, Others are restricting some, anyone that has rental assistance or is in public or publicly subsidized housing from participating. So there's 2,500 different ways to come up with this exact sort of program, but the concepts are all in here as it is. And, you know, my plea is that, um, you know, I'm open to whatever changes fit within the rules and regulations of this fund to this money to get it into people's hands as quickly as possible. You know, Montana, the state of Montana, roughly the same size as us, a little bit more in population. They already have a $50 million program doing exactly this. It also includes mortgage assistance. The application's online, millions of dollars have already th flowed. Um, you know, they went through a different process to stand those up, 
but that I sort of see some of these elements of this Corona Relief Fund as being very similar to a block grant from the federal government that states get, you know, every year and that, you know, I've been involved in probably $200 million of block grant funding over the last 15 years, you know, including Irene emergency money, neighborhood stabilization money, regular CDBG. And it, it comes to the state um, through a formula, through a funding process, the state, you know, authorizes the uh, acceptance of it and approval of it with broad guidelines for how it's to be used within the rules. And, you know, we do that every year. Um, and, you know, each year we don't go through a legislative process that defines, you know, you'll use X amount on mobile home parks and X amount on new construction in Burlington, X amount on sewer and water or uh, an ADA accessibility at a library. Those are all eligible things that we address on a needs basis through uh, uh, an input process from projects. And I, I would argue in the big pictures, I know, you know, David will probably go through the various components of this, that what's most important for us to get right is what's allowable, acceptable, and the actual mechanics of the three months or how far you go back or how far you go forward. I I'm open to what any of it. I just think it's best to design some of that um, in, in post haste and, and in a way that we can signal that this is available and coming because people are asking and thinking there's proposals out there. Um, I know, you know, Legal Aid and Vermont Apartments Owners Association uh, put out a, a sort of an overview that they recommend. They've been working together, you know, recommend that we grant this to Vermont State Housing Authority. And they've added a few other provisions and, and very deep thought about this. Um, and most of all that is completely open. We're acceptable open to that. I, I, I think the biggest picture here is the concept is endorsed with um, high level language that everyone's acceptable with, with room for flexibility. What I'm most, what I'm fearful of, and you heard a little bit of Joan and some of the questions were talked about is we don't know everything. We don't know that we have every right answer, every right program figured out to what the need's gonna be in September. And I would hate for us to um, button this up so tightly that we've thought about everything and we've pigeonholed and in September, what we really need to be doing is shifting a little bit money in a different area. And now we're gonna have to, you know, uh, amend this legislation and change it. And so those are real sort of issues for everyone to, to think about as we move forward on passing, you know, a ton of money in, in short time frame with, I would argue, take the approach of a big block grant um, approach to this that get set the framework, set the thresholds, put it in a box everyone's acceptable with and, and, and give um, us at the agency and our partners who are ultimately going to apply for this money, the ability to um, keep this flexible and meet the need that could change from month to month. Um, you know, I'm second guessing myself that this first phase should have included um, mortgage payments right in the beginning and not hold that for phase one. Um, but the way we're, we're going through this with a, you know, um, you know, a, a, a typical process with lots of input and dialogue, it, 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 I don't know that it's going to lend itself to get us the product that's going to be most helpful um, with enough time to make a difference um, that's needed. So that's a big picture sort of soapbox piece. And then I'll dive into what this says. Um, you know, so the, the creation of the program, it, it charges us with creating this, this rental housing stabilization fund um, to fund statewide and regional housing partner organizations who will administer and distribute these funds to tenants and landlords in need of rental arrearage assistance. Um, it will be directly distributed to landlords on the tenant's behalf. Um, this will be developed in partnership and coordination with other service providers and other agencies um, and require them to develop a streamlined application process, uh, provide uh, support services and promote um, upstream homeless prevention and housing st sustainability. You know, the purpose is clear. It's to prevent um, you know, further evictions and possible homelessness from folks that have received, received lost income um, and resulting in uh, reduced rent payments in this case, and also addressing the needs of the, the various property owners 
that need those rent payments to maintain healthy, habitable housing for folks, pay their bills, pay service folks to come out, in some cases pay actual mortgage on, on that property that they're under threat of foreclosure, um, and that the program will be appropriated and, and um, you know, be, be in compliance with the Federal CARES Act. You know, I think that's the, some of the, the, um, the key things to make sure we all are on the same page of what is eligible, what is, what is risky. Um, and there's a lot of people looking at that. You know, we know the timing pressure. You know, we've heard that loans aren't eligible at this point, but yet, you know, maybe the first instance, if it's a grant and if there is any repayments, it's fine, but you might have to return those back to the treasury. So there's a whole bunch of unknown things and this is an environment we're operating in, which makes it increasingly hard to um, have, uh, you know, exact legislation that gets all that right with what we know today to help people tomorrow. Um, so that's why I go back to this block grant approach where there's authorizing language and many programs in the state that says, yes, you can administer these funds. We authorize it for these general uses. Now go run the program and report back, check in. That would be my argument for how we move this stuff fast and get need. Um, distribution, you know, this is another area where, you know, we're saying that this has to be, um, you know, the department shall develop uh, eligibility requirements for the statewide and regional housing partners to implement this program and to ensure funds are applied towards tenants and landlords equitably and those in the most need. Um, we need to have a needs test here, that, that, that is clear. We need to make sure that it's going to folks in need. But if you start to spell that out, we had some testimony you know, in the Senate um, the other day, and you know, if someone didn't use their stimulus check or their increased unemployment for their rent, but they used it on their car because it broke down, are we gonna spell that out, that that's not a good enough need? I mean, I don't think we wanna get into that level um, of sort of look back and adjudicating, you know, what people use their, their stimulus on. What we do know is that the stimulus money that came and the unemployment insurance and the increase has prevented lots of missed mortgage payments and lots of missed rent payments. There's a few studies on this out, out already that said it could have helped as much as 50%. Um, we could have had, you know, 23,000 rental mortgage payments missed um, and 21,000, um, sorry, 23,000 mortgage, 21,000 rental based on Vermont's population and our sort of housing needs. But at least half of that was prevented by that initial stimulus. Um, but this equitable disbursement on need, you know, we, we list what at least needs to be considered here that the limitations um, of what's eligible needs to include what income level should we go up to? When I scan the two dozen states that already have programs up and running, it was all the way, um, one state allowed up to 140% of AMI, others capped it at 80, and there's everything in between. Um, we didn't propose a magic number because I think that the folks that are gonna run this should say, yep, it's at 100%, it's at 80%, um, but we need to have an eligibility cap to keep this fair and equitable. Um, we need to have um, you know, forms and guidelines so that the tenants and the landlords can agree on what the missed rent was and that they're at risk of eviction um, and otherwise show proof that there is this need for rental assistance. Um, that's clear. We also need to have a mechanism that prevents the landlord from evicting people um, or at least prevents that eviction period for a prolonged portion of time. You know, there could be cases where some folks that are seeking these funds had six months prior, you know, rent or rearage before COVID. And, you know, I'm hearing that it could be our choice that some of that could be included in this. You know, the March 1st deadline for COVID related expenses is that the state couldn't incur those. Well, um, you know, an individual that didn't pay, pay rent and, and the back rent being paid as part of something that goes forward, part of COVID related, may need to be paid in order for the landlord not to proceed with eviction. Because if they were owed six months and all we're saying is three months forward is eligible, that's not gonna prevent that case. If there's flexibility there, 
we're completely willing to look into it. You know, that's another reason why I've been asked what the metrics on this are. You know, we designed this based on three months at that gross median rent in Vermont with a buffer for admin to try to reach 15% of the rental stock. But that, that, that um, percentage of people served goes up and down depending on how long the rental assistance we allow and how deep the, um, the subsidy need is, if you will. You know, whether it is $1,000 a month or some cases, if we're helping folks that do receive some rental assistance, it may only be $100 a case uh, in the, per month in, in those cases. So the, the number of people that can benefit and the length is all adjustable. If we leave the flexibility there to meet the need on hand, which is probably gonna change month to month. Um, we also contemplated a limitation on the number of units owned by any single landlord, but we didn't put a number on that. Um, you know, if the committee has strong views on what that should be, let's put them in there or should it, or leave it up to the, um, service provider, um, which hope will likely be, you know, a statewide provider that is working with many partners on what that limitation should be. Um, and then also we're saying there needs to be a limitation of what the actual cash benefit is. There should be a maximum that's eligible. Um, what that exact amount is based on a monthly period or based on a total cap um, it is also something that we are open to addressing the needs, the real needs, not what we think they are you know, right now and what we've researched on by leaving some of this open um, as we move forward. And then there's the 42 million that's, that's allocated for this, which has uh, an admin uh, percentage built into it um, because someone's going to have to deliver this. They're going to have to have people hire, you know, legal counsel coming up with these contracts. And, you know, I will just say that if, it, you know, this is contemplated to go out through a, a, a competitive grant proposal you know, system, uh, put out in NOFA. And, you know, I don't think we're going to receive dozens of grant um, proposals on this, maybe one or two, um, because this is a lot of work and there is not a lot of different folks that could probably deliver this. Um, I think we know who the main players would be and you know, they're gonna have um, to evaluate what their costs are internally and, and spell out what percentage they need for admin. Um, but it's fair to say we've built admin in there. Um, if, you, if you do the math and figure out how we reach 15% with $3,000 per unit, there's some funding left over for admin, which should definitely be enough to cover um, anyone that would bid on this expenses. So I can stop there and take detailed questions on this one before I jump in, in the next. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. Very quickly though, when you mentioned the other states, you mentioned Wyoming already has a system up and running and was it Wyoming? Um, Montana, Montana. Montana. You know, and, and I guess, have you had enough time to even see, you know, we've heard a lot, we always hear a lot about, well, the state does this and the state does this and, and, and we're really good at this and maybe the state's better than, you know, I mean, there's a lot of that, but have you had any time to actually study this? I mean, whether or not they've done things that you would consider risky mm -hmm. in the way that they've done it, um, Rather, I mean, because I mean, we can all look at the Wyoming website and or the Montana website and go, oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe we should grab a piece of that and see right. if it works. But the, I mean, it really comes down to what are the rules and what are the interpretations. I mean, we can again. My concern from day one has been we can create whatever programs we want, but if we bring this to the finish line and somebody that is there with the book and says no, um. Right. We're no, that's, a, stage that's one. A fair question. Um, you know, I, I just started, I, I was just made aware of Montana's program last night and, you know, went on the website, look, you know, they have notices that they're having tremendous demand already, you know, a little bit of bottleneck, um, but they have um, their entire Corona relief funding. They have um, grant proposals submitted for every industry we've talked about, the arts, public sector, health, business, ag, all on this one website, you push, the amounts are available, they're dispersing money. I think what I liked about their program, well, one, you know, they combined their rental assistance and mortgage assistance and a few other things 
all into one pot and said, you know, we don't need three different pieces of legislation to develop this. They didn't use legislation. Let, let's start with that place. Um, you know, many states, as you're probably aware, the governor just decided how the money was going to be spent and these programs are stood up and they're under operation. Um, that's the majority of states. Um, you know, there's risks in that. You know, I think they probably are crossing their fingers just like we will on some of these things. But it's clear that rental assistance and mortgage assistance is absolutely eligible for this. There just has to be a connection to the impact by the, um, the pandemic. Um, I know I caught a quick bit of, of um, a testimony that was going on earlier today in, in, in Senate Economic Development and on the rental rehab piece, there was maybe a little question about how that relates. And I would argue that we're doing this to rehouse homeless people that were impacted by the virus. They're living in motels. We're doing this to make housing available for low-income Vermonters that need affordable housing that's not available. They're impacted by the coronavirus. Those seem to make the connection to me, but I'm, I'm sure that there is lots of other interpretations and you know, we will get into this sort of risk analysis approach, you know, at every every step. And I, I know that, that that's going to be a challenge. And I think, you know, I've heard the governor say the areas that are the that we have the most risk and we're uncertain. One, we don't have time to, to sort of litigate to see who's right for the next four months. But let's keep those risk higher risk um, proposals um the numbers somewhat low so that if we made a wrong decision it it you know doesn't bankrupt bankrupt uh, us you know and and so the rehab component the ability to rehab housing that quickly across any sector across any partner is risky in this short term and that's a big reason why that there's less money in there um not that there isn't need and that it's also um, more efficient and quicker relief comes to folks that have not experienced the homelessness or the inability to find housing because they're already in it if we can keep them housed, hence the most money in this first section. Um, but. So should I jump into the next section in more? More detail? No, let me let oh. me get a couple questions in here. We have Representative Triano, then Kalaki. Uh, thanks again for being with us today, Josh. Um, so I know I realized that in the next four months that um, uh, time constraints would um, have us moving forward maybe faster than we would like in some instances. But um, I'm thinking in terms of accountability now, certainly not in the terms of red tape that would prevent this money from going out, but more in the terms of accountability so that these funds are protected from uh, possible malicious use um, and from folks that would um, see fit not to uh, continue renting to uh, homeless people or low income people as such. Um, and, you know, weatherization for years has, uh, with landlords have had a uh, qualification that um, they continue to rent to uh, to folks in need uh, after they are weatherized. Um, so, you know, that's a concern I have. But the other piece that still is, is of concern of mine is that I'm just not hearing what support services will be available, how much they will cost, and what they will do to keep homeless people uh, in these homes once they're put there. And that's, a, that's a, such a big piece of this whole puzzle, we all know it sitting here today, well, sitting, standing, whatever we're doing, <laughs> um, that uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's gotta be considered. We have to really think in better terms about as particulars uh, on this, uh, these services that need to be provided. Mm -hmm. so, so on the, you know, that's, that's more to the, to the rehousing component af after the rehab. Um, you know, and I, I've seen the proposal that, uh, that legal aid and, and uh, the um, Landlords Association in consultation with um, Montsate Housing Authority are working on that basically supports the, these concepts and they're developing, you know, how they would partner to, to um, uh, pitch that they, they would run one of these or both of these. And there is, um, 
language that addresses uh, that on the rehousing component, such that um, you know after a unit is 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 rehabbed and we're matching up a uh, you know homeless family that one part of the rental assistance above because we we can we can do this if if we can find some units quickly uh is, is prepaid as a bridge so there there's say four months of rental assistance from the covid rental emergency assistance attached to the unit immediately and um the local uh, continuum of care organization has an mou with that landlord you know party to the to the household that's in there with service commitment that they could not least rehouse that individual without having that commitment in place for those services and rental assistance at, at day one. The challenge is, can you get rental assistance, permanent rental assistance on day one? You know, there's not enough of that available. There's a waiting list. We have, you know, the state one year rental assistance. We have priorities on other permanent lists, but we have this emergency one that the hope is it could be a bridge and that we could more stably house people in permanent housing through this combination than we've ever been able to do in the past in short order. And that's something to reach for, you know, whether we're all successful and, and not pretending this is solving all of the, you know, the needs out there in the homeless and, and um, permanent supportive housing world, but it's, it's something to, uh, you know, I think stretch where we can and reach for and, and um, use this slug of federal funds, you know, to do what we can now. Um, but, you know, you're right, it doesn't work. There would be no point in putting in someone in a unit without the rental assistance on day one and services matched up because it, it wouldn't be successful. We all know that. So, okay, thank you. A hey, representative Kilecki. And I'm um, sorry, before John, um, Josh, are you on a time constraint? Um, not necessarily. <laughs> like to eat dinner tonight, but. <laughs> okay. No, I just, I know that other folks had to be in the next committee. Um, so I have Representative Kalaki, then Representative Zott. Well, thank you, Josh, for coming back to us. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I haven't seen this. I don't know if it's a proposal, this Vermont legal aid thing you've been talking about. So I, I look forward to that. Uh, I just have uh, two, two questions about what's in the bill as, as I was looking at it. Um, last week, you said you would be open to either tenants or landlords receiving the money to pay the arrears. Is that, because in the bill, it looks like it's just to the landlord? Well, it's, or, it's to the landlord on behalf of the tenant. That, uh -huh. That's how all these programs work across the board. Um, okay. It's the only way, you know, the, 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 the landlord is receiving the payment that the right. tenant should have made and yes. it, it keeps it all, yeah. Okay, and then um, w with this kind of uh, complexity for a lot of folks, is there any room, do you think, to have additional support for, for an organization like Vermont Legal Aid to help tenants work through all of this we don't have a lot of resources because it, it's going to be complicated i think for even as simple as we can make it um right now there's nothing like that in the bill well I, so so um that was to the point uh where i talked about the administrative support in there um there is substantial admin dollars built in um that the different people working on uh, submitting a proposal to access and run this program, you know, such as Legal Aid, Vermont Apartment Owners Association, Vermont State Housing Authority are talking through those very issues in that um, what's available for that administration is based on what they need. And I think it's very reasonable to think that you're gonna need some coordination services, I'll just call it that, between uh, landlord liaisons that, that help, you know, legal assistance um, through these different scenarios and that can be built into the administration budget. Um, so, yes. Got it, thank you. Sorry, I was being distracted by my son that was trying to get my attention knocking on the window that he's going to play basketball up the road, okay. <laughs> so socially distant basketball is that zone defense? Right, right. 
<laughs> All right, Representative Zahn. Uh, I was wondering if you could help me understand, um, it, as I was reading the, the draft legislation language, um, it appears that the limitation for um, rental arrearages is three months, and then at the end of that three months, there's an ability to reapply. Is that correct? Yeah, so that, that our original concept was based on three months um, because some of the HUD uh, CDBG COVID special money we received, we've already submitted our application, received our grant agreement. That had a three month limit on it. Um, and so we were kind of crafting these in somewhat unison, um, but uh, we are open to it being longer than that. You know, this allows that three months and said you can reapply. I think this is one of those cases where we should allow the rental arrearage, um, rental assistance to um, uh, cover time, be, be available for time frames longer than three months. Okay, that, that's helpful and encouraging because um, to sneak ahead just a little bit, when I see, um, when I see these sort of $30,000 caps for property owners, and then I think about what rent is, and I think about what three months of rent is relative to $30,000, there's a huge seeming equity disparity there. Um, but if we, if, you know, if we can find a way that we can extend it to a year or however long um, that it becomes, it somehow becomes a little more equitable and in, in terms of property owners versus renters, that would be great. And, and as I sort of mentioned earlier, there, 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 I'm hoping there's a chance to merge some of these on the same property. You know, if, if folks get the um, green light that this is a go at some level, they, you know, I, I know folks already in the Barry area, you know, the cap, um, Suminter um, with Capstone and, and others are surveying landlords right now. And, and would you be interested? How many units, et cetera, if they get the go ahead to start repairing these units that are offline right now that have health and safety codes, get them fixed, get folks in them, and then match this rental assistance up, you're having a situation where you know, the property owner is, is fixing up their apartment with this with this money. And then you have um, the chance where the tenant is having rental assistance because they don't have income right now. It's sort of helping both. Um, uh, and that, that could be, uh, that would be very welcome for, for many folks, in many communities. So one follow up again, I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit to the next piece, but so in terms of the range of things that you were talking about being flexible on in terms of the details and not wanting to be too hamstrung with details, is the five-year um, number for keeping rental units affordable something that you're really committed to or you would you object to stretching that timeline out uh, further? I wouldn't object. Um, I, I think that um, the folks that are talking to the property owners about these funds are asking that very question. You know, what what would be their appetite to have a commitment of a $30,000 $30, grant that they have to keep their, you know, rents pegged, um, you know, below market for 10 years? Um, is that something that they can, you know, um, live with? Is, is that going to work? It, it's going to be really critical to whether this is five or 10 or even further, the guidance around this loan item being a problem with the Corona relief funds, you know, we had structured this so it's forgivable. So it ends up as a grant in the long term. But what I'm thinking about now, hearing some of the guidance that we just heard last night is, let's say someone doesn't meet the conditions of the, these funds um, and they only comply for two years of affordability. So now they have a $25,000 loan to pay off which then we can't keep and recycle in the housing market in our Vermont. We have to send back to the feds. I'm not sure that that is meeting our goals and that, you know, once again, why I think this has to be somewhat flexible and open to um, meet the requirements right up to the last day we put this out because maybe, maybe more of this should be grants and we have to think of other creative ways to keep commitments in, in place. Um, and, and not have this, this forgivable loan, which was going to serve as that mechanism, 
to, to encourage and stretch affordability commitments in exchange for these funds, um, that's somewhat in question right now in my mind. Um, but your point, I, I get your point, and I would, I would, I would push for as much affordability period as we can get with these funds. Thank you. Representative Gonzalez, then Walsh. So thinking of that $30,000, I think about that number because that's a, um, a down payment on a house. Um, and, and looking at our land trusts and BHCB and how we could have permanent affordability with that $30,000 um, per unit in terms of housing. And so um, this proposal doesn't have anything about supporting that. Um, and so that's that's a concern of mine, looking at that and that there are houses available that our land trusts could buy and have permanent affordability instead for that same exact price tag, except for, um, uh, so that uh, wanted you to address that. Yeah, I, I guess I would need to learn more about that number because I, I, I'm not, um, you know, I'm very familiar with permanent affordability, the, the land trust homes and, and the different models there. And I, I don't think $30,000 is buying permanent affordability in, in, in many cases. Um, you know, there might be down payment assistance. You know, we fund the tax credit program to VHFA, which provides a down payment assistance grant. But those aren't um, don't come with permanent affordability restrictions on that program. It, it's a subsidy much that also is used for mobile homes and zero percent homes. Um, I think that the subsidy needed to guarantee permanent affordability and have an ongoing relationship with, you know, a nonprofit group or VHB to have that stewardship. Um, the price tag is much higher than than that. Um, you know, on another issue, the the sort of the challenge with the, the homeless, um, you know, folks in motels and the fact that we have so many deficient um, available housing across the state is an ongoing one that we, we should use this time to address. Because I would argue if we didn't have 19,000 substandard homes across the state and had been investing small sums of public money into the 85% of you know, the housing stock that has private ownership, we would have less of the homeless challenge today. Um, and so that I, I haven't found a model where this um, immediate relief can ensure perpetual affordability in, in the time frame. Um, but maybe there's, you know, I would love to say instead of having a, a you know, a, some rental assistance, we could have you in a home, um, you know, permanently and ensure that that's going to be successful for you. Um, you know, and also, you know, I said in the very beginning, I'm, I'm second guessing myself in that holding the phase two, the mortgage foreclosure prevention and not doing it all at once. So this could be one pot of flexible money that we could adjust. You know, maybe we have more mortgage foreclosure issues and less rental assistance. And, you know, we're going to have a separate, you know, so I, um, I, I, I want to be able to address all the needs um, openly and fairly with under the constraints we have. But you know, I appreciate your question and know that um, you know home ownership and the models that ensure that those homes don't rise above a cost that the next family can afford. You know, work with the shared equity model. Um, you know, they often work in markets that are um, you know you know Burlington and Montpelier that have a, a an appreciation that is very consistent. They're less efficient in Bell's Falls or in Rutland City, where um, often that affordability mechanism, um, you know, you're, you're buying a home below that affordability um, threshold that you've invested in off the market and, and uh, uh, other incentives that don't cost as much can achieve the same goal. But that's just my, my take on some of those initiatives. And for me, it's, it's thinking of that uh, expanding the thinking that, that we're having as we're looking at these proposals, because I, agree that that the proposals in front of us have the pieces that we need and I think we also need other pieces as well and investing in VHCB or the different land trusts across the state are part of that that I see missing in this proposal. All right representative Walls. Yes thank you uh, my apologies ahead of time you were just talking about an area I'm very much interested in my wife came in with 
to ask me about a shopping list. So you may have covered this, but I'm sorry if I missed it. I'm, I'm concerned about the folks who would not be covered by this pending legislation. And I think you were touching on that. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there something more concrete that's gonna be coming uh, down the line to help address that? You know, we've got nearly 2000 homeless. What we're proposing here is not gonna house them all. So where are we going with that? Right. And, and, you know, so my understanding is AHS, you know, has a proposal in the works that you should hear about at some point, which which deals with um, much of that issue. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, this attempt here where the goals of the rehousing program and rehab is to serve homeless families. We have had a consistent sort of 200 to 300 homeless families in Vermont for years. Um, it, it's a problem we should be able to address. You know, it, it's the unit. I would argue the units already exist across Vermont to hold, house every one of the folks that need it. They need reinvestment and they need some services and rental assistance matched up. Um, so this, this is a, a step that, you know, we, we feel we can make a, a big push on, um, but other supports are needed, other plans are needed. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I would look to our partners in AHS and others out there to, to bring some of those other, you know, multiple phase, continue the emergency, you know, rental assistance for motels and hotels as long as they can, using this funding, transition people where they can as units open on a priority basis, start to rehab units to make available, you know, to transition people as soon as those come online, make a conscious effort to fill the vacancies within our known affordable housing network where there are some with priority. Um, take every step, everyone's gonna have a, a, a role to do, to do that and meet that goal. Good, thank you. So Josh, um, I guess the question, uh, I just, I think I just want to wrap up for today, unless someone has, can, is going to pop back in. And I appreciate your time, of course, because uh, this is, this is ongoing and I, and I get the need for um, speed um, and I get the need to think as quickly as we possibly can on, on how we get this money out there. Um, but you brought up uh, the, the laundry list of complexities between income, um, qualifications between whether or not someone's choosing to pay rent or choosing to fix a car. I mean, there's a whole slew of things here that are rife with, um, I think when we do our work, we try to avoid this as much as possible. We also are aware that there are government programs that are in place that on a much smaller scale have dealt with similar programs to this. Um, and so I think we're going to be looking at, you know, do, can we lift the rules from the HOP program in some way, shape, or form to use for the rental arrearage program, which is, you know, by my account, at least 45 times bigger than what we do right now um, in terms of the size of the program. The HOP program is pretty, the rental arrearage program is pretty small, comparatively speaking. So I'm just... You know, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of these details I think that are that can mitigate against speed, but I think that will also, um, you know, when we can identify like programs that already exist that are successful or that need to be funded. I mean, I think we're going to look in that direction too. Um, but I think that it's it's um, I appreciate your your enthusiasm for trying to get this out and for trying to get it to the people who need it most. And, and we'll keep working with you and with others to, um, to really formulate a program. And, and again, I can, I'm going to keep coming back to what is it the treasury says that we can do. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm committed to, you know, sharing, you know, I've, if I learn more, talk to colleagues in other States, talk to our partners about what is already working that we could, quickly add to this or change or remove, I think we have to sort of look at this as a, a, a you know, that a, a document that, that is still live and that we should be adjusting to get it um, right and to serve the need right to the very last day, because yep. we should be learning from what other people are doing, what is working, what isn't working. And then also, you know, hearing from the folks that are, are gonna be administering this 
uh, from their experiences and who, and who they've talked to, what they think is going to be uh, set them up for success. So um, happy to keep talking through this um, and keep an open mind on um, changes and, and anything you also hear from from your partners. So thanks yeah. for uh, for being partners on this. No, I, you're very welcome. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I mean, and, and for being as open as you have been for the last three months, really. Um, as we've been working through this, because um, this is this is a big deal, and while I'd like to be able to say that um, we'll solve the homelessness, homelessness problem, I, we know that we won't completely. We know that we will provide as many residences, and I, and I want to go back to what Representative Triano said earlier about the need for services, and 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 I think in the in the very near future, we're going to define what those services are. I mean, as I've had these conversations with folks about what it takes to house people who are homeless. I mean, again, there's so many different categories. So, so somebody who's suffering you know, a job loss and lost, had to get out of their place, whether it was a foreclosure or, or a rental um, because they lost an income, whether it was a mental health issue, um, whether it's a combination of all. I mean, it, it, this is a very multifaceted population of Vermonters that requires specialized services. It's not just like having somebody in a cubicle someplace to take their call uh, and answer a question about what should I do about something. Uh, it, this is, and it's more than just having enough money to pay the rent um, in subsidy form. It is, this is some pretty intense, these are some pretty intense individuals and households that require some pretty intense services. And so, um, having that component in place will make the chances of success um, so much better yeah, than I this. Agree. And so how we get there, whether we can use this money, how we figure it out is, is still, um, we won't have the answers by Tuesday. Yeah, um, no, I'll, sure. think, I'll think about if there's a way to incorporate, so even if it's short-term funding into the, you know, the rehousing, the rehab component, if there's a way, if, if one of the barriers is going to be a commitment on some initial support services, can that be built into that budget to also fund the service provider to pay the local, you know, continuum care counseling organizations for their increased support for the folks we rehouse? If that, you know what I mean? How can we use sure. this money, you know, focused, I know it was focused on the rehab and the housing families and I've always been thinking other groups are going to be coming to the table with their, what they do best, you know, the, the resources and the specialty from that community. But in absence of seeing that soon, you know, I, I'm open to start shifting some, com, some of that money to say that's available in here. Just mm -hmm. so you know, service providers, there's some money built into this so that this can hit the ground running while those other systems are still being, um, tailored to 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 help on the long term sorry now my dog wants to get out of the room <laughs> it's hot it's um, hot yeah and 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 then i guess i'll just leave you with this is is that idea that you know working with private landlords or even even the nonprofits, you know housing when down street opened up their new facility in in downtown barry it was right at the beginning of when governor shumlin was requiring that anybody who received state aid for housing um, have 15% of their, their units occupied by formerly hom homeless households. And it took 20 applications to find four households. And so, you know, just on a basic application on a, in, in an industry at, at, at a nonprofit housing group, which has as part of its mission to house the, you know, the, the, as deeply as we can possibly go, you know, it's still a business proposition. And so having those other supports in place, whether it's services and or rental subsidies is so important. I, that's very fair. I don't want to also take advantage of, you know, as you said, you know, small private landlord, oh, I'm going to get $30,000 for the state to fix up this unit and just sort of a hope and a prayer. Great. And then, you know, they're left with an unsuccessful, you know, Tennessee, which turns their world upside down on both parties, you know, has, uh, um, leaves a lasting impression that I'm not going to reach, reach out to try to serve folks in need, you know, that, that wouldn't be fair for us to do either. So I, I appreciate how hard it is to um, match up these two goals.
No, and eyes open for the private landlords. I mean, I, I, yeah. we took testimony earlier from uh, from one of our peers just about how difficult it is to you know try to form a master lease. Um, but you know, damage uh, water damage is expensive, and all it takes is one uh, misused dishwasher uh, yeah. to, to for that to happen. And um, and and then you know that scares people away. And, and it makes it very difficult. So those are, you know, the, the parameters that we're working with, again, while we're built, we're, we understand and hear um, that, and we're also working against the clock here. Um, it won't make much sense if we don't get money to people in, in September um, from, this, from this package. Uh, so we are all working on a deadline of pretty darn soon as well. So, no, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank you. All have a good weekend. All right. Thank you. Um, committee, I was looking at the schedule for next week. And um, so we have, as a whole, we have Tuesday, we, we meet at 3.30 for caucus of the whole, which usually runs for an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, Wednesday, there's at least three hours of floor time followed by either caucus meetings like the working Vermonters or a chairs meeting. Um, Thursday, we as a committee don't have anything scheduled and there is a huge block of time Thursday morning uh, from 8.30 to 12.30. That is free according to that, according to the um, map that I received from Catherine Lavasser. Uh, and then on, I mean, on Wednesday afternoon, there's time in between in between the floor sessions, but that's pretty brutal if we try to do floor time and then a couple hours of, of, um, of that. So is uh, Ron? The answer is no. Uh, we can we can go off YouTube. Um, thank you everybody for watching. We're just going to do some housekeeping now. Thank you. Um, and Ron, let us know when we're free. But those are the times. Those are the times. That, and and so, um, does Thursday morning? Does any block of Thursday morning work? Um, for do you want to see the schedule in front of you, and do you want to stay live? Uh, no, you can take us off. 